Here are some rich people who are victims of painful, persistent disease as they result in gluttony, and they are willing to pay large sums of money to get rid of their illnesses, and they will not sacrifice their habits of overeating. They want to gratify their taste from rich foods in immoderate amounts and have their health as well. Such people are completely unfit for good health because they have not yet learned the first principles of a healthy life. Here are some employers who adopt crooked measures to avoid paying fair wages and in hopes of making their larger profits reduce the wages of their work people. These employees are altogether unfit for prosperity and when they find themselves bankrupt in both reputation and riches they blame circumstances, not knowing that they are the sole authors of their conditions. I have introduced these three cases merely in illustrating that the truth that people are in the causers, though they nearly always unconsciously of their circumstances is that, while aiming at the good ends, they are continually frustrated and accomplished of those good ends by encouraging thoughts and desires that cannot possibly harmonize with those ends. Such cases could be multiplied and varied among indefinitely, but this is not necessarily as we can, if we so resolve to trace the action of the laws of thought in our own minds and life. And until this is done, mere external facts cannot serve as a ground of reasoning. Circumstances, however, are no complicated. Though it is deeply rooted and the conditions of happiness vary so vastly with individuals that our entire soul conditioning, although may be known to ourselves, cannot be judged by anyone else from the external aspects of our lives alone. A person may be honest in certain directions, yet suffer privations, while another person may be dishonest in certain directions yet acquire wealth, but these conclusions usually formed with one person who fails because of his or her particular honesty, and that the other prospers because of his or her particular dishonesty. This is the result of a superficial judgment, which assumes the dishonest person is almost totally corrupt, and the honest person is almost entirely virtuous. In the light of a deeper knowledge and a wider experience, such as judgment is found to an erroneous. The dishonest person may have some admirable virtues and others not to possess, but the honest person may have certain vices, even those subtle ones, that they are absent in others. The honest person reaps the good results of honest thoughts and acts, but also experiences the suffering for his or her vices that produce. The dishonest person, likewise, garners his or her own sufferings and happinesses. It is pleasing to a human's vanity to believe that one suffers because of one's virtue, but not until we have exterminated every sickly, bitter, and impure thought from our mind and washed every unhealthy stain from our soul. Can we be in position to know and declare that our sufferings are the result of our good and not our bad qualities? And on is a way to a supreme perfection. Yet, long before we reached it, we will have found, working in our minds and in our lives, a great law that is absolutely just, and that cannot therefore give you for evil, give good for evil, or evil for good. When we possess such knowledge, we will then know how to look back upon our past ignorances and blindnesses, and our lives are, and always have just been just ordered in our past and experiences, good or bad, where equitable outworkings of our evolvings, yet unevolved selves. Good thoughts and actions can never produce bad results. Bad thoughts and actions can never produce good results. This is but saying that nothing can come from a corn but corn. Nothing can come from nettles but nettles. We understand this law by a natural world and work with it, but few understand it in a mental and moral world. Although it is operating there in just a simple and undeviating, and they therefore do not cooperate with it, suffering is always the effect of wrong thoughts in some direction. It is the indication that we are in harmony with ourselves, with the law of our being. The sole and supreme use of suffering is to purify, to burn out all that is useless and impure. Suffering ceases for those who are pure. There can be no object of burning gold after the dross has been removed, and perfectly pure and enlightened being cannot suffer. The circumstances that we encounter with suffering are the results of our own mental inharmony. The circumstances we encounter with grace and pleasure are the result of our own mental harmony, grace and pleasure, even, blen even bless blessedness, and not material possessions, are the measure of right thoughts. Suffering and misery, not lack of material possessions, are the measure of wrong thought. Some people are miserable and rich. Some people are blessed and poor. Blessedness and riches are only joined together when the riches are rightly and wisely used, and the poor only descended into misery when they regard their lot as a burden unjustly imposed upon them. Poverty and overindulgences are two extremes of misery. They are both unequally, unnatural, and both the result of a mental disorder. We are not rightly conditioned until we are happy, healthy, or prosperous. In happiness, health, and prosperity are the result of harmony adjustments of our inner with the outer of ourselves, with our surroundings. We only begin to be happy, healthy, and prosperous when we cease to whine and revile, and when we begin to search for our hidden justices and regulates that regulates over our lives, and when we learn to adapt our minds to the regulating factor, we cease to accuse others as the cause of our conditions, and we build ourselves up strong and healthy with thoughts. We cease to lash out against circumstances and begin to use them as aids in our own rapid progress. 
and it means it's discovering the hidden powers and possibilities within ourselves. Law, not confusion, is the dominating principle in the universe. Justice and not injustice is the soul and substance of life. Justice and righteousness, not corruption, is the molding and moving force in the spiritual government of the world. This being so, we have the right to ourselves and find our universes right. And during the process of putting ourselves right, we will find that we are altering our thoughts towards things and other people. Things and other people will alter towards us. The proof of the truth is in every person. The proof of truth is in every person. And in therefore admits to easy investigation by systematic introspective introspection and self-analysis. Let us radically alter our thoughts and we will astonish at a rapid transformation that will affect on the material conditions of our lives. We will imagine that our thoughts can be kept secret, but it cannot. It rapidly crystallizes into habit and habit solidifies into circumstances. Base thoughts crystallize into habits of drunkenness and resentment, which solidifies into circumstances and destitution and suffering. Destruction thoughts of every kind crystallize into confusing and exhausting habits, which solidify into distracting adverse and adverse circumstances. Thoughts of fear, doubt, and indecision crystallize into a weak, inconsistent habits, which solidify into circumstances of failure, poverty, and dependence. Lazy thoughts crystallize into habits of uncleanliness and dishonesty, which solidify into circumstances of foulness and poverty. Hateful and condemnatory thoughts crystallize into habits of accusation and violence, which solidify into circumstances of injury and persecution. Selfish thoughts are the kinds that crystallize into habits of self-seeking, which solidify into circumstances that are distressing. On the other hand, Beautiful thoughts of the kinds that crystallize into habits of grace and kindliness from which solidify into genial and sunny circumstances. Constructive thoughts crystallize into habits of temperance and self-control, which solidify into circumstances of response, peace. Thoughts of courage, self-reliance, and decision crystallize into strong, productive habits which solidify into circumstances of success, plenty, and freedom. Upbeat thoughts crystallize into habits of cleanliness and industry, which solidify into circumstances and cleanliness and pleasantness and pleasure. Gently and forgiving thoughts crystallize into habit of gentleness, which solidify into safe, healthy circumstances. Loving and unselfish thoughts crystallize into habits of unself-forgetfulness of others, which solidify into circumstances of sure and abiding prosperity and true riches. A particular train of thought persisted in being good or bad cannot fail to produce the results on our character and circumstances. We cannot directly choose our circumstances, but we can choose our thoughts, and so indirectly yet in surely shape our circumstances. Nature works with us, and though us to help us gratify from our thoughts to encourage the most of opportunities are presented with the most of speedily bring us up to the surface, both to good and to destructive thoughts. As soon as we cease from our negative and destructive thoughts, all the world softens towards us and is ready to help us. As soon as we put away our weak and sick thoughts, opportunities spring up on every hand and aid the strong. Resolve. As soon as we encourage our good thoughts, so hard fate shall bind us down, and no hard fate shall bind us down to misery and shame. The world is our kaleidoscope, and the various combinations of colors it presents to us at every succeeding moment are unexquisitely adjusted pictures of our ever-moving thoughts. You will be what you will be. Let failure find its false content in the poor word environment, but spirit scorns it, and it is free. It is master's time, it conquers space, in cows that boastful trickster chants, and bids the tyrant circumstance uncrown and takes a servant's place. The human will that forces unseen, the offspring of deathless soul, can hew away to any goal, though walls of granite intervene. Be not impatient in delay, but wait as one who understands. When spirit rises and commands, the gods are ready to obey. 3. The effect of thought on health and the body. The body is a delicate and plastic instrument, and it responds readily to the thoughts by which it is impressed. The body is the servant of the mind, and it obeys the operations of the mind, whether they are deliberately chosen or automatically expressed. At the bidding of an unhealthy thought, the body sinks rapidly into the disease and decay. At the command of a glad and beautiful thought, it becomes clothed with youthfulness and beauty. Disease and health. Like circumstances are rooted in thought, sickly thoughts will express themselves through a sickly body. Thoughts of the fear may have been known as to kill a person as speedily as a bullet, and they are continually killing thousands of people just as surely as 
though less rapidly. The people who live in fear of disease are the people who get fear and disease. Anxiety quickly demoralizes the whole body, and it lays it open. It lays it open to an entrance of disease in pure thoughts. Even if it's not physically indulged, will soon affect the nervous system. Strong, pure, happy thoughts build up the body, vigor with grace, with vigor and grace. The body is a delicate and plastic instrument and responds readily to the thoughts from which is impressed. The habits of thoughts will produce their own effects, good or bad, upon it. People will continue to have an impure and poisoned blood so long as they propagate an unclean thoughts. Out of the clean heart comes a clean life and a clean body. Out of the defined mind and defiled mind proceeds a defiled life and an impure body. Thoughts is the source of action. Life and manifestation make the source pure and will all be pure. A change of diet will not help those who will not help change their thoughts. When our thoughts are pure, we are longer and we no longer desire impure food. Clean thoughts make clean habits. Those who have strengthened and purified their thoughts do not need to consider the malevolent microbe. If you would perfect your body, guard your mind. If you would renew your body, beautify your mind. Thoughts of malice, envy, and disappointment, despondency rob the body of its health and grace. A sour face does not come by chance. It's made up by our sour thoughts. Wrinkles that mar are drawn by folly, suffering pride. I know a woman of 96 who has the bright, innocent face of a young, of a young girl. And I know a man well under aged middle-aged man whose face is drawn into the unharmonious contours. The one is the result of a sunny disposition. The other is the outcome of suffering and discontent. As you cannot have a sweet or wholesome place to live unless you admire the air of sunshine freely into the rooms, so a strong body and a bright, happy, and serene face can only result from free admittance into the mind of thoughts of joy and goodwill and serenity. On the faces of the age, there are wrinkles made by sympathy, others by strong and pure thoughts, and others by card by negative emotions. We cannot distinguish them. For those who have lived righteously, age is calm, peacefully, and softly mellowed, like the setting sun. I recently saw a philosopher on his deathbed. He was not only accepting years, but he died as sweetly and peaceful as he lived. There is no physician like cheerful thoughts for, dissip for dissipating the ills of the body. There is no comforter to compare with good will for the disbursement of the shadows of grief and sorrow. To live continually in the thoughts of ill will, cynicism, and suspicion and envy is to be confined in the self-made prison cell. But to think well of all, to be cheerful with all, to be patiently learned to find the good in all, such unselfish thoughts are the very importals of heaven. To dwell day by day in thoughts of peace toward every creature will bring abounding peace into that possessor. 4. Thought and Purpose Thought allied fearlessness Thought allied fearlessly to purpose becomes creative force. Thought allied fearlessly to purpose becomes creative force. Until thought is linked with purpose, there is no intelligent accomplishment. With most people, the bark of thought is allowed to drift upon the ocean of life. Aimlessly is a vice, and such drifting must not continue for those who would steer clear of catastrophe and destruction. Those who have no central purpose in their lives fall easy to prey of petty worries, fears, troubles, and self-pitying, all from which is indications of weakness, and which will lead just to surely and deliberating planned crimes, though in a different route, to failure, unhappiness, and loss, for weakness cannot persist in a powerful, evolving universe. We need to conceive of our legitimate purpose in our heart, and set out to accomplish it. We should make this purpose in centralizing points of our thoughts, from which will take the form of spiritual ideas, and will make us more material and Make us, and it may be a material object according to our nature at the time, but whichever it is, we should steadily focus our thought forces upon the object from which set before ourselves. We should make our purpose our supreme duty and devote ourselves to the attainment of our purpose, not allowing our thoughts to wander away into inferior emphases, longings, and imaginings. This is the royal road to self-control, true concentration of thought, even if we fail again and again. To accomplish our purpose, as we necessarily must until our weaknesses is overcome, the strength of character gained will be the measure of our true success, and this will form new starting points for our future power and triumph. Those who are not prepared for the apprehensions of a great purpose should fix their thoughts upon the faultless performance of their duty, no matter how insignificant their task may appear. Only this way can the thoughts be gathered and focused, and resolution and energy be developed. That being done, there is, no, there is nothing that may not be accomplished. The weakest soul, knowing its own weakness, is believing this truth, that strength can only be developed by effort and practice, will once again begin the excerpt of itself in adding effort to effort, adding effort to effort, patience to patience, and strength to strength. It will never cease to develop. It will at last grow divinely strong. 
As physically weak people can make themselves strong by careful and patient training, so can people with weak thoughts make themselves strong by exercising themselves in right thinking. To put away aimlessness and weakness and to begin to think with purpose, to enter the ranks of those with strong ones and strong wills, and those only recognizing failure as one of the pathways to attainment, those who make all conditions serve them, and those who think strongly attempt fearlessly and accomplish masterfully.